Yes, sir. Welcome, everybody. Nice to have, uh, nice to be able to speak here and have Link Forward in San Francisco finally. Um, this talk is about sharing some experiences um, in running running Flink at um, a large scale, and so the talk is is going to be kind of a, if you wish, a mixture of just a bit of a, a few stories of things that we learned when we when we thought, you know, ah, of course we know how to build a scalable system. That's what we do, and then it turns out like, oh, okay, well, that's not what you can do, um, and 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 how how certain features kind of evolved or are evolving. Um, other things are just like best practices that, that, that can help you know if you run, if you're actually rolling, rolling it out at large scale and you're running into certain issues you may recognize and like a, have, have an idea of what to, what to do about them. Okay, so it's kind of a, like I said, lessons learned at large scale together with various things that we thought should work and didn't and what, we're, what we can do about them. And um, as part of that, it's also kind of a preview of a, of a bunch of fixes that are coming up in Flink that are partially in there coming up in 1.3 or like as part of the longer term roadmap. All right, so um, let me quickly say um, a few points when, when we say what, like running Flink at large scale, what does that actually mean? Because, you know, there's, there's various dimensions to it. One is, one is clearly large data volumes, events per second. Um, large application state is another dimension. Complex data flow graphs and high parallelism. And interestingly, it turns out that you know, the large scale in the, in the sense of the large data volume seems to be the least challenging one. The other ones are actually slightly more, uh, slightly more tricky. So let's go into a few of these, um, these things that we en encountered over time and um, yeah, what we already started doing about it. All right, so um, I have roughly three sections. The first is in the area of distributed coordination. The second is in the area of checkpointing. And the third is in the interplay with uh, state storage, file systems, all of that. So let's start with, the, um, with distributed coordination. All right, so just as a, as a quick re uh, recap in, in how Flink works, whenever you deploy a job. So Flink consists of the job manager, which is the coordinator, the task managers, which actually do execute the code. Um, whenever you do a deployment or also when, uh, when tasks are recovered, um, the job manager actually issues an RPC call to the task manager and gives it the task, the, the kind of the code to execute in a, in a certain operator, um, together with all the configurations and so on. And as we you know, we, when, when we initially built the first version of Worst was actually even before Flink, this was just, you know, like some, some plain old RPC service. And at some point in time, we, we saw the problems with that and we actually moved it to, um, to something based on Akka. So for those of you who, who don't know, Akka, Akka is a, is a distributed actor programming library and it's actually fairly good at distributed asynchronous messaging which is actually a great foundation for distributed coordination. So by the time we had done this and, and you know, just hammered some, you know, how many, how many of these RPC calls, like how many of these deployment calls coordination can we throw out per second to how many task managers we were thinking, okay, we're actually good, this thing works now. Um, and then over time we, we saw some, some users actually showing up and saying, you know, I can never actually get a deployment through it, always times out before it's through or, um, I can actually remember one case where where user said, you know, whenever we start to dis to deploy something, our job manager goes away with out of memory. So, what was actually happening? We're 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 looking a little bit into these um, into these RPC calls, and here are the things that are actually part of um, of such an RPC call. So every time you you deploy a call, you're sending basically four kind of um, big pieces of information between the systems. The configuration of the um, a job-wide configuration, things like um, configuration of serializers that need to be constant across individual tasks, um, the actual task code and the objects. Um, so, what is really the code that the um, that this particular operator executes? The map function, the window function, all of that. Um, something called a recovery state handle, um, which is basically a pointer to to the state that the operator should um, start from kind of the, the checkpoint that it put up, could, uh, should pick up. And then a bunch of like IDs or correlation IDs. These are basically just um, identifiers just to make sure that every time 
you're interacting with different um, processes. You're, you're sure you're talking to the exact right one um, within, you know, leader election that changes um, between um, between nodes, you know, recovery that you, you connect to the right execution attempt of the other tasks and so on. And, you know, in, in the usual case, these things are all kind of small, but it can actually be that some of them don't have, end up being as small as, as we initially anticipated to be. So the, the configuration objects that are sent around, the recovery state handle, the correlation of these, these are all in the order of a few bytes or a few kilobytes, but it, it actually turns out that this task code and objects, they can grow a lot larger than we initially anticipated. And um, the reason for that is, I guess, in, in mostly two parts. First of all, um, whenever, you deploy, whenever you deploy a task, it contains basically all, all the objects that are needed as like ex auxiliary code for this task to run. That includes actually, um, you know, like serializers and everything to pick up data from state, to pick up data from the network streams and so on. Um, this can occur in like variable uh, various instances, especially if you have long chains of operators together. They can have a lot of serializers, different serializers, which actually add up in their in their configurations um, to to quite a bit. And the second part is that what what actually gets deployed as the code can by itself actually be fairly large. And that is, if you wish, an artifact um, from how how users actually write Flink programs. So if you write them in the Fluent API and you just create like a map function or you just like a, a Scala Lambda. Um, in the, like in the Java Scala world, when you actually take these function objects and move them to the cluster, you basically serialize them, including the closure. And it just so happens that once in a while, the closure actually picks up a lot more than you would want it to pick up. Um, and there's, there's like non-trivial cases where Flink cannot figure really out exactly that these things can be pruned or so. So sometimes you actually move a lot of contextual information there. So it just ends up that these task coding objects can actually be fairly large. And then from there, it's actually not, not a big surprise what happens. Let's do some, some quick back of the napkin calculation. The number of RPC calls that you actually do, or the RPC volume in the end, is the, the number of tasks um, times the, the parallelism that you have times the size of the state objects. Let's ignore the other parts of the, um, of the RPC calls um, for a bit. And then if you actually, if you actually look at a like, non-trivial um, non-trivial flink job, you, you can actually see if you multiply this that you end up at an RPC volume of roughly 20 gigabytes when you're trying to deploy a job. So that, that's quite a bit, actually. That is like a bit more than, than was our, our initial guesstimate. So let's actually see if you, if you do this RPC deployment, how long does it, does it take for all these operators to, to actually arrive on the task managers? So if, you have, if you're lucky and you have a really good network and actually you, you get effectively 10 gigabytes per second, um, in, in bandwidth out of the job manager, which sends out all these calls, still takes you around about 20 seconds to do that. Um, I'm assuming here with a 10 gig network, you're transferring around about a gigabyte in the end per second. Um, a slightly more realistic one, I think if you look at the, like what the, what the average um, machine gets, for example, on, on Amazon or Google, um, Google Compute Engine, is, is more in the order of, of three gigabytes per second. So you're already at the point that you're it takes you a minute for the job manager just to send out all the RPC messages and then nothing else has yet happened. Or, yeah, on, an, on a network like one gigabit per second, it actually takes you three minutes to, to throw those out. So putting that in context with the fact that the default RPC timeout is actually 10 seconds, you're, it's pretty clear, clearly obvious why, you know, why actually once you start doing this at a, at a bit larger scale, um, we've been seeing a lot of times that, you know, I'm, I'm not getting through any, any job deployments, what's happening. So um, that's kind of the result. There's a, there's a um, I mean, the good news is this, this does only happen if you combine, if you wish, if you wish heavy pipelines, which have a lot of very big stateful objects with a very large parallelism and a decent number of tasks. But if you actually find yourself in that situation, um, what you need to do is, at the moment, increase the RPC timeout. Um, there's a bit of a caveat, just don't, don't set the RPC timeout to whatever, like five minutes, you know, to be on the safe side, because the RPC timeout is not the only um, failure detection mechanism, but it's kind of, it's one variable in the failure detector. So you don't want to set it just arbitrarily high because it can make failure detection in some cases um, a bit slower. And um, the, the long-term um, fix that we actually want to, want to introduce into Flink to make the whole RPC system 
more scalable is, um, I'm starting with that on the next slide. So if you actually look at what is, um, what is involved in all this uh, messaging, um, I mentioned these four parts, like job-wide configuration objects, um, the task code, recovery state handling correlation IDs. It turns out that half of them are actually constant across both parallel subtasks of the same, of the same operator and across restarts of the operator um, uh, across failovers. And only, only some of, uh, of that information is variable, and that, that is fortunately actually the very small part. So what is upcoming in Flink, it might actually just make it into 1.3, um, is a way to actually have a good part of these messages being transferred out of band, so it's not part of the RPC service anymore. And uh, you, can, you can think of it like that. Um, so Flink contains something called the blob server and the blob cache, which is part of the like, distribution system for large, just large binary objects. They're currently mainly used to distribute uh, libraries if you're in a situation where you use dynamic code loading. And um, the way that, that we're changing this RPC system is actually that the constant parts, like the config and the task objects, are actually put into the blob server from the job manager, and then the RPC call only contains recovery state handle correla correlation IDs and uh, basically the block pointers to the task manager. That reduces the message size of an RPC like reliably to a few kilobytes. Um, and throwing out, throwing out a few ten thousands or hundred thousands of messages actually of a few kilobytes is something that Akai in fact can actually handle. And then what, what becomes part of the of the actual task execution. Um, once the task starts on the task manager, it will look into the blob cache. Similar as it, it looks into the blob cache to see that it makes all the libraries locally available that it needs. It will look into that cache and see that it also makes the kind of the state objects, the configuration objects and so on available if they're already there, which you know, as, as you actually redeploy, um, you'll actually find them there. But the first time you do this, you'll actually um, pick them up from the, from the blob server. So what that means is that the very first time you actually deploy a job, you will see that um, you'll see that the RPC messages get through quite fast. What you will what you will see is that the tasks spend these extra um, these extra um, bits of time to actually download uh, the data. And the the thing that is worth mentioning actually that the blob server and the blob cache are in in one three also not necessarily a, like a centralized thing anymore. Not everybody downloads from the job manager, so. Um, for example, if you run this on a, on a high availability setup with uh, HDFS or S3, then the blob server actually caches its artifacts in HDFS or in S3, and the blob cache will directly pull them from there. So you're kind of getting the benefit of using the, using the distributed file system for artifact uh, distribution, which means you're getting more than the bandwidth of just the, the job manager to distribute them as well. So yeah, we'll actually uh, move the small parts to the, the RPC services and the large parts to the, to the kind of distribution of uh, distribution out of band distribution all right um, that's kind of my favorite topic that's coming up now how do we actually how, what are some of the experiences or lessons learned when when doing checkpoints at scale and um, it's it's my favorite topic in some sense because I think one can say that robustly checkpointing it's probably the most important part of running a large Flink program. So if you, if you just take your Flink program and you know, throw it out uh, without checkpoints and just you know, hammer it with a lot of events per second, hammer it with large state, that by itself usually just runs. Um, the, the thing that, that you need to get right is make sure that the, that the checkpoints actually reliably go through. Once you have that, then you, you're set. And in order to see what, um, what exactly um, what exactly are some of the like experiences in running this? What are the what are the things to watch out for? Let's actually quickly recap the checkpoints and then look a little bit into what what Flink exposes as information from the individual checkpoints, how to interpret that, and what are the the things that that are um, that are important to watch out for. Okay, so so just a quick recap. When when Flink does a checkpoint, it basically um, consists of a few things. The the master node decides to do a checkpoint. It will send these notifications to the sources that inject the checkpoint barriers. The checkpoint barriers flow through the sources, and as they pass through operators, they trigger state snapshots. Um, conceptually, how exactly, for example, state snapshots work and so on depends on the concrete implementation of the of the state backend. So, from a from a very abstract principle, barriers go in and flow through, trigger state snapshots. 
Let's look at one aspect to, to the checkpointing, which is kind of the, the more, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a detail, but it actually turns out to be like really important to understand what, what really happens there, and that is um, checkpoint alignment or, um, at operators. So in order to get exactly once guarantees, um, you need to make, or Flink needs to make sure that what is accounted for in a checkpoint is exactly all events that are before a checkpoint barrier and no event that is after a checkpoint barrier. That way the checkpoint barriers divide the data into pre-checkpoint, post-checkpoint genera generation. Those align exactly with the Kafka offsets, those align with the, with the snapshots in the state and so on. And if that all aligns and you restore it, for example, completely aligned, then, then this is what gives you exactly once guarantees. It's also what gives you the, um, what gives you the view of even though even though something goes down in a like in a non-deterministic computation, if you bring it back up, it will still look like one valid failure-free execution path. So this alignment phase um, consists of, if you wish, this, uh, this checkpoint alignment consists of various phases. So when you when when something um, when a checkpoint starts and the first stream arrives um, with its barrier at the operator, the, uh, the first checkpoint barrier arrives, then that operator will start beginning the alignment. And um, it, will, it will actually remember that it has seen the barrier from that stream, and it will wait for the barriers from the other stream. During that time, it will actually buffer up um, the data from that stream. It's not, it's not like a memory um, buffering. It's actually taking, it's lo looking a little bit actually like what, what Kafka internally does, just like one node embedded small in Flink. It's just like using the, basically the disk, disk cache for that. Um, so it's, it's mostly in memory unless you get like really large alignments and it has to be evicted. So that, that way you actually hold it mostly in memory and um, you get it to, to disk when you need to. So why do we actually do this kind of buffering? Why, why don't we just block the inputs and say, hey, hold this off until, um, until we've actually seen the barriers from other inputs? There's, there's one like small detail why you need to do it and that is certain, that is certain tricky topologies that, that end up actually where one operator forks off sending multiple downstreams which are joined in complex fashions um, yeah, further downstream. In, in these kind of situations, um, the philosophy in Flink is if you want to completely avoid deadlocks in these kind of situations, you have to, you, you cannot, you, you're, never, you're never sure that you can actually block a downstream operator because it might actually um, result in back pressure along certain paths that will effectively, if you wish, reside in like cyclic, cyclic weighting, which is the distributed de deadlock. So even though, no, most topologies don't quite have that characteristic, just to be on the safe side to say, you know, we're not actually giving you a checkpointing mechanism that can, in the worst case, actually lock up. Um, it actually starts buffering that on the input side. And that continues until all uh, barriers have been seen from all, um, from all inputs. And then um, once that happens, the downstream barrier is evicted and the snapshot is taken and then the, the buffered input is actually um, uh, taken and, and replayed into the operator and downstream. So that's kind of a critical thing to understand. Um, okay, let's look a little bit of, um, into, into the checkpoints and like when you run checkpoints, what, what are points to watch out for? So I apologize, these are not actually screenshots from, from, from an at scale thing. I, I just copied them yesterday evening from the, from the Flink docs. So they actually refer to kilobytes of state, but they, you know, like the counters in there are, are kind of like the, the fields that, that are interesting for us to look for are the same. So um, this is actually, yeah, it's actually a screenshot from the Flink checkpointing um, UI. And so every, everyone who runs a Flink job at large scale, I can only like warmly recommend to make, make use of that UI to, if you want to understand if your job is healthy. It's actually, it's a really nice one. It contains a lot of information and it contains really exactly the information that you need to, to actually get an assessment if something goes wrong. Um, what went wrong, yeah. So this is basically the overview um, for one checkpoint. In this case, it was checkpoint four. It gives you kind of a, a summary where um, where the checkpoint is, this one is completed, um, how much state was involved in the checkpoint, how long did the checkpoint take, um, how much was, uh, how heavy was the alignment, and so on. So if you actually find yourself at the point that you, that you think, okay, something might be up with a checkpoint, um, you should look into that UI and then into the individual operators to see what operator is actually the one that has a, has a problem during checkpointing. So 
These numbers are the ones that, that give you a rough overview of whether something is, is good or bad. So this one's actually a good checkpoint, you know, 15 milliseconds is, is a decent end-to-end -end time. Okay, it was also a pretty small state. Um, kind of small bu data buffer during alignment, so everything is fine. Let's assume it was not fine, and we'll actually have to look into the subtasks. So in that case, we would look into, into the second one, um, which is the one that actually has, you know, has some alignment, um, has some state. If we look into that, into the details of that subtask, um, it will tell us actually for, or into that operator, it will kind of give us an overview into um, what were the minimum, average, maximum, um, like metrics encountered in each of that checkpoint. For example, what is the synchronous duration of the checkpointing? What is the asynchronous part of the checkpointing? How long did the alignment phase take? How long, um, how much data was buffered in the alignment phase? There's also um, a view that basically then tells you for each individual subtask, uh, how long did that one actually take? How much data did that buffer? But in most cases, you're actually okay, just you know, looking at the summary at the minimum, average, and maximum. So let's go through all of these things and, and try to understand them a little bit. Alignment buffered and alignment duration kind of gives you an, um, an overview of how well did the checkpoint alignment um, behave. The lower the number, the better. I mean, having, having nothing in there, like zero uh, bytes needed to buffer an alignment, alignment took zero milliseconds, that's, that's kind of ideal, but you'll not, you'll not see zero at a at large scale. But you want to see like low milliseconds and ideally few kilobytes to mag at max a few megabytes of, of state buffered in alignment. The second part is how long did the actual snapshot take? So how long did it take for that particular operator once it started the snapshot to materialize its state, to persist, to make it durable and recoverable? And then there's kind of a, a number that is not explicitly in there, but it's, it's kind of easy to compute, which is how long did it actually, how long was the checkpoint delayed in the operator from when the master actually triggered it? So the, the job manager decides to do a checkpoint, and then at some point an operator takes the snapshot, but it, it may be quite a bit later, and that, that would be the delay. So you take the end-to-end -end duration, subtract the synchronous part and the asynchronous part, and then you see um, what the delay is. So in that case, for example, the minimum delay would actually be eight milliseconds. So the synchronous and asynchronous snapshot took, took nothing. There was also nothing in the alignment. So yeah, the delay from when the job manager decided to do the checkpoint to when the downstream operator actually did it was eight milliseconds. And these eight milliseconds correspond to how long does it take from uh, the job manager to send out all the RPCs, for the RPCs to arrive, for the barriers to be injected, for the barriers to flow through the streaming graph, to, you know, to, to mark the state and everything. So let's, um, let's quickly understand each of these numbers and, and what they mean. So if you have actually a consistency lo consistently long delay, like end-to-end -end duration minus sync minus async is a long value, and that is, it's not just for one checkpoint, but it's consistently high, it, it typically means that your system is operating under back pressure, right? So you, you, for example, have a slow sync that you cannot keep up with, and the data starts queuing up in Flink, in the Flink network stack, which means when the checkpointing um, inserts a barrier, that barrier cannot travel as fast to the system as you know as the system would otherwise allow it because it it's the barriers are back pressure too. The checkpoint barriers cannot overtake data, um, otherwise you would violate exactly one semantic. So they they have to flow with the data. And if if the, if there's back pressure and the data flows you know slower because of let's say a slow sync, then the barriers flow slower as well. So that, that usually means you're under a constant back pressure and you, you're probably in an under-provisioned system. How long does the snapshot take? So usually it's not a problem if these snapshots take for a bit. Like if you're, if you're running a system that has a few hundred gigabytes of state and you know, you're trying to check from that to a file system with a not terribly good network bandwidth, then this might actually, this might actually take a bit and it's, it's completely okay. That doesn't mess up Flink. So, um, but if, if this is too long, for your use case in the sense of the, snap, the snapshot materialization takes so long that your checkpoint interval becomes so long that you're actually not meeting your like recovery SLIs anymore, then, then this actually means that you're probably in an, you know, in an under-provisioned uh, setting. So you have too much state per node, um, and, and the snap, or that the snapshot store, your file system cannot quite keep up with the load you're putting on it and trying to materialize the state. Both, both can actually be, it could be that, you know, both the outbound bandwidth and Flink um, is uh, too much, uh, is not enough for the large state or, or just that the file system doesn't accept the state at that, at that speed. This is something that we expect to actually greatly change with the next release with incremental checkpoints where, where only the changes since the last checkpoint are stored. So um, 
this should go in general down for, for all jobs that, that make use of incremental checkpointing. But like as I said at the beginning, if, if you're okay with your checkpoints being, let's say not every few seconds, but if you're okay with checkpoints like every minute and you take, you take half a minute to materialize the state and so on, if that's not a problem for you, then that is not per se an issue because especially if this, if this is part of the asynchronous um, snapshot materialization, it doesn't really impact the, the progress of the job. The most important metric of all of those is actually the, the alignment duration. So keeping, um, keeping an, an eye on that one, that that one is, like, is consistently low is something that, um, that, is, that is important. So why, why is that? Why is that the case? Um, so alignment basically is affected by all in-flight data you have at a, at a certain point in time. So imagine that the different sources are injecting their, their checkpoint barriers. And in the worst case, let's say one, one leg of the program, you're, let's say you're doing something like a join here, and one path has a lot of data being, being in flight and the other one nothing. That means that the, the barrier on the side that has no data in flight immediately reaches the operator and the other one on the leg that has a lot of data in flight will have to wait until all that is consumed. And the, the amount that these barriers can, can go apart is, if you wish, exactly the maximum amount of in-flight data that you're, that you're allowing. So in-flight data being data that is either on the wire, this can actually be a significant amount of data on a, on a 10 gig ethernet wire at any point in time. Um, and also um, the amount of network buffering capacity that Flink by itself has the, this um, magic network buffer parameter. So you do want to allow for some amount of in-flight data at any point in time in a streaming program because the capacity to have some in-flight data allows you, allows you to buffer across like um, issues in the network. So there's, there's one, one, for, for some reason the capacity of one link like drops for, for a second or so goes really low and you, you, you don't want this to immediately also slow down your producing operators. Um, or you know a downstream machine is in a, in a, in a GC or so and you, but you don't want this to immediately like synchronously affect the, um, the upstream operators as well. On the other hand, you, you don't want the amount of in-flight data to be infinitely large because the amount of in-flight data kind of determines how far away the barriers can at most be, which is what, what is the maximum amount that can, uh, can happen during your alignment. So actually getting, um, getting a good number for that is, if you wish, one, one of the slightly magic settings in Flink 1, 1 and 1, 2. If you want to run it at large scale, I'm very happy to say that in 1, 3, we've finally eliminated that thing. So um, you don't have to do this anymore. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it becomes an auto-tuning parameter. So if you're, running, if you're running Flink 1, 2 and you want to come up with a, um, with a good setting to run it at, at larger scale, I would say do a rule of thumb calculation to set the number of network buffers roughly to, to something like four times num shuffles, num, num parallelism, um, slots you have in your in your task manager. That is a that's a good start. Um, if you're if you're running um, if you're going to one three, then you don't have to worry about this anymore. Like the the channels tune themselves uh, automatically using some heuristic based on the connections involved in the transfer step, and um, yeah. So um, let's let's stick with the issue of checkpoint alignments. Uh, once more, because that it, it really is the like the the thing to um, to bear in mind when you're running large scale checkpoints. So once in a while, um, there's going to be an expensive alignment in Flink, um, and it is it's something that's like almost unavoidable to once in a while happen because it it does happen as soon as the as the different paths have have like vastly different characteristics. So let's let's assume something like that. Um, we're having a topology here, some, some join here, some sources here. There's a, there's a pretty big window here. And let's assume it's, kind of, it's an hourly window and you're accumulating a lot of, of data. And at some point, the hour fires and the data goes downstream. And this happens concurrently with a checkpoint. So that actually means that, that the barrier here will actually queue after the window. And um, this barrier here will, have a much, will actually travel much faster, right? Because that one will kind of have to go with, with the data after the window, which means that this operator here will actually have to kind of process the window data out before it can actually trigger a snapshot. So 
Um, so what, once in a while this, um, this does happen. Um, another reason why this can happen is that you, know, you, you may have just like a, a setup where, where a bad GC stall happens just concurrently with a checkpoint. So um, if you get a bad alignment once in a while, that's actually not a, bi not a big deal, right? It's, it's, it doesn't really kill the checkpoint. It, it will go on. The only thing that, that you really want is that the system actually catches up from the heavy alignment after a while. Because if it doesn't, if you don't basically give it the chance to catch up from that alignment, it will actually kind of make the next checkpoint alignment heavy as well. So um, you, can, you can kind of, kind of see, see that illustrated here. If you have operators that are, um, that, are, that are one after the other, and one operator actually is undergoing, let's say the bottom left one here is undergoing a heavy alignment, it will not actually emit its barrier um, downstream, and the next operator will also kind of get a delayed barrier on that input, which makes that this one's alignment will also be a little more expensive. If you actually not allow them to catch up in, in the middle uh, from that, then on the next checkpoint, they'll they still be in the mode that they're replaying, that they haven't replayed all data from the alignment, or they may just have replayed the data from the alignment, but they've processed less from the mainstream, from the non-buffered data, compared to other other paths that have not gone, undergone this alignment, you may actually be at the point that um, that the next that the next checkpoint alignment costs more than you would wish it to cost as well. So um, yeah, the the main thing to make sure there is, like I said, give, giving them some time to catch up before starting the next checkpoint. And there's actually some very simple ways to do that. So um, it turns out that that uh, a very useful parameter is um, to set the minimum time between checkpoints. Um, for Flink, so it, it's almost it's almost like you want to configure checkpointing that way and not based on the checkpointing interval. So um, the minimum time between checkpoints marks the amount of time that Flink waits after a checkpoint has completed or has been you know aborted and expired before it triggers the next one. And this kind of interval is it's it's an, an amount of time that is pure processing, you're not sharing bandwidth with persisting, um, persisting state, you're not, sharing, um, band you're not sharing capacity with um, writing, writing data into alignment buffers and so on, so it's, it's just like pure catch-up processing capacity. So a, a, kind of, a kind of nice trick, I think, to configure the checkpointing for, for heavier setups is set the checkpoint interval to whatever you want, as low as you want it, maybe a second or so, and then, and then really think about what, what do I th what do I actually want to, to give the system as, like as, as pure processing time? Maybe I want to give it like 15 seconds of like pure progress between checkpoints. And then set the minimum pause between checkpoints to 15 seconds. And then it will actually, it will trigger its checkpoint such that if the checkpoint happens to, if one checkpoint goes bad and actually takes 30 seconds, it will not actually trigger the next checkpoint immediately because let's say your checkpoint interval was 15 seconds before. Regular checkpoints go five seconds, you have 10 seconds of progress, five seconds of checkpoint, five seconds of progress, but all of a sudden a checkpoint takes 30 seconds, and you would actually immediately trigger another checkpoint after that, what, afterwards, because you're already after your checkpoint interval, and you would have to, to immediately trigger one as well. Uh, configuring it such that you say, okay, I actually want 15 seconds of progress, and then, you know, whatever the checkpoints take, the checkpoint interval kind of adjusts to accommodate for that, for that yeah, pure progress time. Another thing that we actually learned over time is that Asynchronous checkpoints by themselves just help a lot to never, um, or not to never, but to like much rarer get into these um, bad alignment situations and to actually recover from them much easier because actually as soon as the asynchronous part of a checkpoint starts, you're already in the phase that you're catching up from the alignment. Um, you're already consuming the data that has been buffered in the alignment. So let's, let's quickly look into asynchronous checkpoints because that's, if you wish, in, in the checkpointing side, one of the big lessons learned is if we if we want to like if you want to go really uh, really big, the best the best thing we can do is basically make everything that can be possibly asynchronous asynchronous, and that is that's one of the um, kind of the big development threads right now. So an, an asynchronous checkpoint means that at the point in time when the barriers reach the operator. <coughs> and they, they trigger a snapshot, they're actually not pausing to materialize that snapshot. What they're basically doing, they're just tagging the version of the data in there. Um, it's kind of a, it's a cheap metadata operation and then it continues processing and then there's a background thread that actually tags that and materializes it. So for, um, that's for example how it is implemented in, in Flink 1.2 in, in RocksDB and in Flink 1.3 also for the, um, 
for the main memory based stack, uh, state backend on the Java heap. So in Flink, in Flink 1.2.0, uh, if you're using the, the memory state backend, snapshots are synchronous in 1.2.1, one there's kind of a hidden way to activate the asynchronous parts, kind of like a, like a beta feature. And in, in Flink 1.3, I think we're gonna make this the, um, the, the default mode so that, that the main memory state backend also does asynchronous snapshots. Um, similarly, if you use um, operator state, so in operator state in Flink, so state that is not um, that is not bound to keys on a keyed stream, but state that just corresponds to let's say um, that corresponds to parallel operator instances, state that you keep in the let's say keep in the just as regular variables in the functions of your um, yeah of your map function of your process function and so on. Um, these will actually be asynchronously materialized in Flink 1.3 as well. And the last thing is a piece of state that, that is not always obvious that it exists. Um, it's the timers. They're, they're kind of easily overlooked. Timers are often not terribly large state, but they are state. Timers kind of track when, when individual windows should fire or when individual callbacks to stateful processing should occur. So if you have a lot of, you know, a lot of session windows ongoing, then you typically have at least one timer per session window, which will notify you when the session expires and when you should emit that. And you know, the timers just contain basically a key reference, a window reference, and a, like a timestamp, so they're not terribly large. But if you're, you know, if you're tracking a few hundred million session windows, then this accumulates also to a few, um, to a few bytes. In Flink 1.2, this is definitely still synchronously checkpointed. In Flink 1.3, we might get an asynchronous version for some parts of that in. There's, a, there's an open pull request in, for example, how to do timers via RoxyB, which would actually just naturally give an asynchronous snapshotting behavior to them as well. And in, in Flink, and after Flink 1.3, we're striving to make them in all cases also asynchronously checkpointed. Just because that way we've seen in practice, it, it goes a long way with, with um, mitigating like problems that even if you get into kind of a, like a, a tricky checkpoint once in a while to get out of that situation again. All right, um, a quick, maybe a quick, because I thought that could be useful, maybe a quick mini flowchart in, in helping how to choose a state backend in Flink based on a, on a few things that, um, that we've seen. Um, starting from the top, if you have state larger than memory, it's a no-brainer, you, you go to RocksDB. If the state data is actually not larger than memory, then ask yourself, um, what kind of objects am I using? Am I using just like simple like longs and strings and so on, or am I using like really complex objects like nested structures? bit vectors and so on that are sort of expensive to serialize. If yes, you may want to actually go with the asynchronous heap state backend. If not, you know, if that is actually not an issue, look at your data rate. If you have a low data rate, why not go with RocksDB? It's on the, if it's, it's performance, it's not going to be an issue for you. But if you have a really high data rate and you care about, you know, optimizing the, optimizing the performance you get out of a single node, go to the asynchronous heap backend. All right, it's a bit simplified. Um, we only have a few more minutes. I talked way more about checkpointing than I thought. So let's, let's quickly go through some of these um, lessons learned from file systems and object stores. Um, all right. So what, what actually can happen quite, um, quite easily is that, that Flink exceeds the capacity of the, of the downstream systems. 30 seconds left. Okay. All right. Then... Actually, let me just uh, let me just go go through the rest of the slides as a preview, um, and we'll put them online <laughs> to look into the details. So we've um, we've seen that actually becoming a pretty interesting issue as well, especially with with S3. You can you can come to the point that just by checkpointing a lot of small state to these file systems, especially if they have certain maximum amount of requests that they take, that you actually um, get to the point that you you exceed their capacity. There are a few ways you can actually um, work around um, reducing the stress for file systems if you have a lot of like very small states. Instead of checkpointing it in the like regular way where each task manager puts individual pieces of state in the file system, there's certain thresholds from um, to where it doesn't do that anymore but where the actual data is just stored together with the metadata which means they'll be part of the acknowledgements, they'll be written by the job manager which reduces the number of files and the number of file system requests. Um, there's a bit of um, work in progress around making state cleanup a little more more snappy because 
this, uh, there's a little bit of an interesting mismatch in the sense that a lot of task managers create state, but when state is actually released, it's released by the job manager. So one job manager to keep up with a thousand task managers, even though it doesn't have to create the state, it just has to delete it. At, at some point in time, you can actually see that the job manager not trivially keeps up with that anymore. So um, there are a few things that we're, um, that we're working on, we're implementing to actually take care of that. And there's also a bunch of work in progress to actually make sure that when state is actually written, it's handed over between task managers and job manager and written. There's, there's certain situations, like if a process crashes just in time, then there's no one that really owns that state anymore, so it's actually going to, to stay there. There's no one whose responsibility it is to clean that up. So there's um, kind of work in progress to, to make sure we're, um, we're sweeping the, the, the checkpoint storage and making sure that these orphans, orphaned things are discovered. Let's actually keep it at that and just see, <laughs> see if we can take some questions. I'm sorry, it was, it was too much material for one talk. All right, thanks, Stefan. I really appreciate you. Thank you.